Hello, and welcome to another edition of Brussels Sprouts. I'm Andrea Kendall-Taylor. And I'm Jim Townsend. And we're so glad you can join us. On today's episode of Brussels Sprouts, we're pleased to present you with the final installment of our New Year's series, during which we've had the chance to take a step back over the past month and identify some of the big picture trends shaping the transatlantic relationship and international affairs more broadly. We've discussed the war in Ukraine, the conflict in the Middle East, and the potential rise of the far right in Europe. Today, we're widening the aperture for a broad-ranging conversation, a tour of the horizon, and what's in store for 2024. It seems like perhaps every generation comes to believe that they are living through extraordinarily complex and unprecedented times. But in January of 2024, with the war raging on in Ukraine as we near the two-year mark of Russia's invasion, conflict in the Middle East threatening to ignite into something larger, an intensification of nuclear threats from North Korea, and a high-stakes election here in the U.S., the picture indeed looks complex. So to help us anticipate and make sense of what's ahead this year, we're very pleased to have CNES's own Michelle Flournoy and Richard Fontaine with us to discuss the issues and trends that they're following most closely. So welcome, Michelle, and welcome, Richard. Be back. Thank you. Good to be here. Um, brief bios. So Michelle Flournoy is co-founder and managing partner of West Exec Advisors and former co-founder and chief executive officer of CNES, where she currently serves as the chair of the board of directors. She also served as the undersecretary of defense for policy from February 2009 to February 2012. And Richard is the chief executive officer of CNES. Prior to coming to CNES, he was a foreign policy advisor to Senator John McCain, and he worked at the State Department, the National Security Council, and on the staff of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Okay, so let's indeed widen the aperture, take the 10,000 foot view or even the 100,000 foot view. Um, and Michelle, maybe we'll start with you just to ask about how you would characterize the current state of global affairs. And given all of your experience, um, do you think the U.S. has faced such a complex and complicated national security environment, or at least in your kind of professional life? How, how would you describe where we are? Yeah. You know, every generation likes to say they are facing, we are facing the most daunting national security inheritance, et cetera. But I actually really think that's true this time. Um, I think, it, you know, 20 or 30 years from now, we will look back on this moment as a very serious inflection point in the international system where uh, relationships and alignments have become much more fluid and dynamic and volatile. Um, and where in particular Russia, China, Iran, and to some extent North Korea are looking at a new sort of access or uh, you know, grouping, not necessarily a full-blown alliance, but a, you know, a marriage of convenience in, in many areas. And you'll see the global South and many other countries sort of playing the role of swing states, you know, sitting on the sidelines, not wanting to have to declare for either the U.S. and the Transatlantic Alliance on one hand and our allies in Asia or uh, Russia, China and the Axis. Um, but we'll sort of issue by issue decide what is most in their interests. And so you'll have that fluidity. Um, at the same time, we see the, the confluence of both new challenges, uh, like the increasing and multidimensional competition between the U.S. and China, but also, you know, perennials, you know, Hamas attacking Israel, creating this new conflict uh, in Gaza, um, the persistent hostility of Iran and its proxies uh, to the West, to Israel and others, um, the threat of terrorism, the threat of proliferation. Um, and that, that, that will be alongside, you know, um, other, other conflicts like Russia, Ukraine, um, uh, and even transnational challenges like climate uh, and so forth. So very complex environment. And then you add to that two other factors. One is profound period of technological disruption. So what gave us advantage in the past won't necessarily give us advantage in the future. We've got to make new investments and also improve our adoption of innovation uh, at speed and with scale. Um, and then lastly, the polarization. You know, there was a lot of many years where you could kind of define a bipartisan consensus 
that would sort of, you know, fluctuate a little bit, but it had kind of guardrails on it. And I think with the advent of the Trump administration and a much more kind of isolationist uh, America first kind of bent in some parts of our polity, um, you now have a much more unpredictable United States in the view of our allies um, and a much, much larger question mark uh, over where will American foreign policy go, um, not only after the 2024 election, but even now look at the debate over aid to Ukraine and so forth. So I think it's a very volatile, high stakes time. Yeah, Richard, I, you, I want you to add to that. But the one thing I would layer on, I think one thing that seems just so distinctly different is this uptick in the propensity or the presence of interstate conflict. I mean, if you just think back a couple of years and people talked about the long peace and that, you know, in that this idea that interstate wars were dead and we were only thinking about intrastate wars, civil wars and other things. And you think then since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, you've had not just that war, you had some, uh, the Hamas attack on Israel, but smaller conflicts, Nagorno-Karabakh um, and the Azerbaijani um, decision to use force to retake its territory, all of these interstate strikes with Iran into Pakistan and into Iraq. And I mean, it really, indeed, it feels like the landscape has fundamentally shifted in a very short time. And I wonder how you think about that and if this is really the new normal uh, moving forward. Well, I do think that there's sort of a couple levels at which things are different now than they have been uh, in a long time, if ever. So there's the broad realignment that Michelle talked about. And now, for example, the existence of this non-Western block of countries that is available to countries that otherwise would have been isolated. And so, I mean, very recently, Iran was mostly geopolitically isolated. It's not now. North Korea, the most isolated country in the world, but now it has you know, not just China, it has Russia available to it for sort of great power uh, support and so forth. So you have this alignment that's going on. And I also think the West is drawing in, West broadly defined is drawing in uh, more closely. You also have a lot of violence in the world. Um, I did a count last night, quick count based on the news. So in the Middle East, in the past week, I believe the following have either conducted and or been subject to military strikes. Israel, Hamas, the Houthis, Hezbollah, Iran, Syria, Pakistan, Iraq, Turkey, the Kurds, commercial shipping, and the United States. That's in one week in the greater Middle East. That's a lot. Um, and so, you know, it has previously been thought that there's three broadly strategic regions of the world for the United States. There's Europe, there's the Middle East, and there's Asia. We have state-on-state -state land war in Europe. We obviously have the kind of things that I just described in the Middle East. We have the rising challenge of China with the North Koreans contemplating who knows what in Asia. And what that's leaving out are the things that basically get very little attention. You mentioned nagorno karabakh but Venezuela threatened to invade and annex Guyana, which was barely a blip. The raging civil war in Sudan is unbelievably brutal. There's not a lot of bandwidth to deal with that. And so you have... And the uptick of coups, like that's been a remarkable change too, right? The coup used to be dead and now they're back with a vengeance, which I also think is related to a lot of this. The coup belt, as it's now called, yeah. uh, across Africa. So when you add all these things together, I, I do think that this is a more complicated, more complex international environment than we've seen, at least in my professional lifetime. And you also have it, it I think, more challenging for policymakers than it's been um, just through the sheer multiplication of issues and crises and would-be crises and things that are going on. Uh, thank you all very much. Uh, I, um, you know, we usually at Brussels Sprouts, we try to end on an up up uh, note at the very end, you know, and I, I, I see we're already starting with a, a downer. <laughs> so we'll see how far down we'll go by the end. But, but you know, um, one thing I kind of my benchmark in a lot of ways for crises and, and our ability to handle crises is the Balkans. And I, it's my benchmark because I remember when the Balkans, when the 90s, you know, on the one hand, we were doing NATO enlargement. On the other hand, we we're at war in the Balkans. It's this tragic uh, time there. And uh, and I really, uh, as a young guy 
you know, uh, trying to work those things. I just didn't see how we could get out of it. The fighting seemed to be never ending. The hatreds were hot. Uh, no one wanted to be at, a, at the conference table. Uh, and uh, both NATO, the European Union, the United States, we we're all trying to figure out what role we were. And I remember driving home from the Pentagon going, how does this ever end? How does this end? But the Balkans did end. And I remember being really surprised at how the nations, uh, particularly uh, uh, Brits and the French and Norwegians and the U.S. and others jumped into the diplomacy. We had all kinds of these quartets and quints and meetings here, meetings there, everyone trying to come up with ways to stop the fighting. And eventually uh, it had to burn itself out in a lot of ways. But but there really seemed to be a coming together of this of the West to try to deal with uh, the the warring parties and to, and to try to bring things to uh, uh, to an end. Um, and I guess for me, what worries me is that during this time is I don't see that kind of coming together of the West, the kind of leadership, the kind of groups that would come together. The Brits were leading one group. The French, you had special envoys, you know, Carl Bildt and others going in. There was a lot of diplomatic activity, a lot of hard work being done um, in various capitals. And I just don't have that feeling. I think there seems to be a lot of hand wringing. Uh, I'm thinking about, you know, I talk to the allies quite a bit and there's a lot of hand wringing. They're focused on Trump and some other things. Uh, I, I just I don't I just don't feel that uh, that engine, the engine room going in the West as we began to put together groups to handle something like the Balkans. Am I wrong on that? Or are we, in fact, kind of drifting a bit in terms of of trying to come together as a community to deal with all these problems? Yeah, I would, I would take a different view, um, Jim. I mean, maybe this is because I'm genetically an optimist. Uh, I have to be to get out of bed. I used to be. I used to be. Jim Towns and the optimist. But, but so let me give you a couple of counterpoints. You know, if you look at how the U.S. has played its hand in the last few years in the Indo-Pacific, um, we have revitalized our, our alliance relationship with Japan, with Korea, with uh, Australia, um, bringing multilateral fora together like AUKUS, the Quad, even the Philippines has invited us back in to, you know, rotate forces through and work much more closely with them. So I feel like um, our posture in Asia as a reaction to the aggressive nature of Chinese foreign policy, that is, there's been some real progress there. Um, you know, and I'd also add in a strengthening relationship with India. So I think that's a very positive thing. Um, I look at Ukraine up until this point, um, prior, you know, until the, the question of USAID was in question, you know, Putin got exactly what he didn't want. He got, he, we have an enlarged and more solid and more cohesive NATO than ever. Um, we've done a fantastic job up until this point of providing assistance to Ukraine and moral, you know, solidarity. I, I'm very worried right now about the Congress maybe not even passing this aid package, but if they do pass this aid package, I worry that it's the last one. And what will that mean for Ukraine? It will certainly incentivize Putin to just wait out our election, see if Trump comes in so that he, he can, uh, you know, uh, count on us abandoning Ukraine. So there's, that's mixed. But even in the Middle East, in the horrible situation we see with the attacks on Israel and now what's happening in Gaza, um, even there you have people coming together to try to talk about a strategic pivot to say, can out of this horror come a strategic realignment in the Middle East that will ally the U.S. and Israel and Gulf states against Iran and its proxies um, and potentially give international support to resolving the Palestinian question. Um, and so the, you know, the, maybe those are focusing, I'm focusing on the silver linings, but I do see in certain, I do see in some places, you know, countries coming to get together, you know, to try to support a more lasting sort of peace and security. Is it everything we want it to be? No. Um, but I still see some signs of, positive, you know, leaning in. So I think, I feel, 
thing that's so hard to wrap your head around is because I think two things can be true at the same time. I agree with the picture, Michelle, that you just laid out. And there is a lot of positives and bright spots. And there has been in many ways a coalescence and strengthening of either the West, the transatlantic partnership, but also these relationships with, you know, quote unquote, liberal democracies more broadly. But at the same time, it is also true that a coalition of countries that you both mentioned in your first remarks is also coalescing. Richard, we, we I think we're toying with this axis of, of upheaval, which I think is quite sticky and catchy. So yes, it is true that the United States and its allies and its alliances and its partnerships are strong, but there's this new development out there that you've both mentioned. So Richard, I mean, what, like, what does that mean for how the U.S. engages and what is it that's that's catalyzing the coalescence of this alternative axis? Be I mean, is it that the United States is in decline? Um, I know that's kind of a debate is, are these countries that are stepping up to fill a void, a void and take advantage of what they view as U.S. decline? Is, is the U.S. actually declining? I mean, how would you... How do you a think about America's role in the world, and then b the, this this axis of upheaval? Yeah. So just on the previous question, I think that two things are true at the same time. I think there's a coalescence of the West, and there's a bigger sort of supply of energy and activism to deal with big problems than there was certainly before the war in Ukraine. I mean, if you had said previously that Japan and South Korea and Australia and New Zealand and all the transatlantic countries would be doing all these things for Ukraine and all these things to Russia, it would have been a stretch, but they are. The problem is, is that the supply is not sufficient for the demand because the demand for all that attention and energy and activism as we were just describing, has crossed multiple crises, multiple regions simultaneously. Um, and so, you know, it's a very hard thing to sort of set priorities when you've got all of this happening at the same time. On well, this question of the um, axis of upheaval, I think the thing, the glue that really holds them together is opposition to what they see as a unfairly Western dominated world order that does not allow for these countries, Russia and China at the helm, the space and the status and the power and the standing that they deserve by virtue of their weight and history and domestic power and population and all this other stuff, that they've lived in a war, a world that is basically ordered anachronistically and I don't think the United States is declining, but I think the Chinese leadership thinks the United States is declining and that China's rising. And that is just something the world's going to have to get used to. And so they want real revisions to the way things are. And the problem with that is some of the revisions that they seek are ones that are fundamentally illiberal. They're fundamentally um, contrary to, you know, the policy preferences of the West. And they would be fundamentally uh, provocative in terms of keeping basic peace and stability so but i but but you know that that glue is not going to go away anytime soon and it seems to override all the other differences that we once thought that they might have regional differences or whether putin's going to be the junior partner of china and be okay with that i mean the, that all seems small beer compared to um unified opposition and desire to revise the the way things are Maybe a question for both of you. I mean, thinking about so China kind of at the center of that coalition or certainly the weightiest, most consequential actor of this grouping. Um, there have been lots of assessments about China's decline and, you know, that it's a declining power. Its economy is bad. It's so corrupt. A, curious if you agree with that. I mean, how? so how, I guess I say, in January of 2024, how are you both thinking about the nature of the China challenge? And in the aftermath, in the wake of the Taiwan election, um, how would you characterize the risk of a future confrontation between the U.S. and China? I mean, there had been some kind of alarmist reports putting dates on things and that she wants to make a move before, and I'm forgetting what the date was, but kind of where are we in terms of characterizing the nature of the China challenge and the, the propensity that the U.S somehow gets involved in confrontation with Beijing. Yeah. No, I, I think there's no question that she has his hands full right now with a whole host of domestic 
challenges um, from his demographics and declining population to um, or declining population growth um, to uh, you know his economy, uh, the handling mishandling of COVID and lockdown, um, corruption as you mentioned, um, you know all kinds of of issues that give him a pretty full plate right now. But to, you know, I do think that China still has, you know, he has very strong ambitions to assert China's dominance in the region and particularly with regard to Taiwan. Um, I think he sees that as a legacy issue and wants to get it done on his watch. I think he is making the necessary investments in his military to ensure that he can, um, whether it's impose a blockade or even launch an invasion, um, that he can create huge challenges for the United States by contesting every domain from space to the air to the on the water, under the water, cyber, et cetera. So I think, you know, the ambitions are there, the investment capability is there. I think for the moment, he's not ready. He doesn't want to, you know, bring this to a head today or tomorrow. But I think, you know, in the foreseeable future, you know, he has specifically stated himself, he wants options, viable options by 2027. That's the date everybody keeps talking about. In my view, my mind, that means that for the United States and its allies, we have to be very, very prepared and confident in our ability to deter Xi and make him think twice about use of force in by then. So we've, you know, got a few years, but um, now obviously something could happen by a miscalculation in the meantime. 2027 is not written in stone. It's not a magic date, but I think it gives us some time horizon to be thinking about, which tells us if we wait for all of the modernization that's coming online in the 2030s, that may not be fast enough, um, but we probably have some time to do a better job of, you know, integrating innovative new capabilities that give our forces um, meaningfully improved capability to be ready to be tested um, in, in the next four or five years. Richard, I, I want to hear your thoughts on that too. And then a question on our actual capacity to, I mean, all of the things that the Russia-Ukraine war has exposed about our defense industry base and our preparedness for conflict. But Richard, first, I, I am curious about what you think on the China front. Yeah, I think China's, the China challenge is big and continuing to grow. It's not diminishing. And there's a lot of accounts now of the kind of things that Michelle was talking about at the beginning, the youth unemployment in China, you know, higher than it's been in a very long time, long gone are the double digit growth rates in GDP, and they're down to 5% or something like that. They've got a huge cratering real estate sector. They've got demographic problems with a shrinking population, all true. Uh, but their economic growth rate last year in 2023 was higher than that of the United States. Their defense budget went up, not down. Their defense capability acquisition is expanding, not contracting. They've got you know, new uh, weapon systems. Uh, they've got, of course, the advantages of geography. Um, their economy is uh, certainly much bigger than the Soviet Union's was at its height when we thought the Soviet Union was kind of pretty consequential problem during the Cold War. Um, and their ambitions still seem high. Yes, you hear Chinese leaders now say China's open for business, come invest here, where you weren't hearing that so loudly a couple of years ago. But you also saw them convene and expand the BRICS group of developing countries recently. And, uh, you know, just a few days ago, stripped Nauru away as a diplomatic partner from Taiwan and uh, and 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 play a, a role in this um, sort of counter West uh, block of countries that seeks a, a different future. So um, the United States has many advantages in this competition. All we really have to do is put them together in the right way. Um, but the, I think that we should not be complacent in thinking that China's just going to sort of peter out here and uh, we can move on to other things. So what if you look at our side of the ledger, though, in terms of like our capacity to do these things? I mean, how confident do you both feel that the U.S. has the capacity to deal 
with not just the China challenge, but with multiple chi challenges simultaneously. So, you know, we've got the crisis in the Middle East. We've talked about tensions in uh, with tensions with China, with rising nuclear threats from North Korea. Obviously, the war in Ukraine continues. I mean, how, how do you think about our actual bandwidth and capacity to deal with all of these challenges simultaneously? And how much do you worry about the, the kind of nightmare scenario of like a two war world? And, and how seriously do we have to take that in terms of defense planning? So, I mean, as a global power of global interests, I think we always have to be thinking about more than one theater at a time. And it's really the primary problem is how do you deter simultaneous aggression in multiple theaters, especially if you are intervening heavily in one of them. Um, you really want to try to prevent a, a sort of two more strategy as much as possible. But, you know, I, I think, um, you know, we have all the right elements. I would not trade our economy for the Chinese. I, mean, I would not trade our innovation ecosystem for theirs. I would not trade our people or our armed forces or, you know, if you go down the list, we have the best hand. Our challenge is we get in our own way in terms of how we play it. So, for example, when Congress cannot agree on a budget, that puts us in perpetual continuing resolutions. When you have continuing resolutions, you both freeze the money at, at last year's levels, but you also prevent new starts. At a period where we have to be accelerating our innovation and our innovation adoption, not being able to start new programs is a huge problem and with enormous impacts potentially on our ability to deter if we don't get our house in order. Um, I think, you know, um, in terms of bandwidth to manage simultaneous crises, I understand that, you know, the crisis of the day always seems most urgent and, and draws energy and focus. But I think you need to protect parts of, you know, government to really focus on the longer term challenge of the competition with China at the same time. The good news is the people working Ukraine and the people working China and the people working the Middle East are day to day are largely different people. But it comes together at the very top and it comes down to where senior leaders really spend their time and their focus and their energy. And that requires a very disciplined, strategic approach to make sure we're not just focusing on the urgent, but we keep focused on the important as well. Yeah, it also, you know, of course, comes down to some of the resource uh, trade-offs as well. And we're seeing this in the defense industrial base, probably more than anywhere else. The defense industrial base can only turn out so many of whatever it is you would want to buy. And if the demand for those, especially across regions, is higher than the supply, then you're going to have to decide who goes without kind of thing. And that's not something we're going to fix overnight, but it is something that we have to work toward. Again, knowing that we don't have to do all this all on our own. We do it with our allies and our partners, and we happen to be in the block that has by far, other than China, the biggest economies in the world. And so that's a huge advantage. I would say the thing that I worry about is not that we have kind of the underlying advantages, which whether it's alliances and coalitions or geography or the size of our economy or the strength of our population or or whatever it is, it's about being able to convert those things into outcomes, given the right amount of political will and political wisdom, because we want neither to underreact to challenges nor to overreact. And we, I think a lot of times we'll say, look at all the things that we're doing in response, for example, to the China challenge. And it's, it's you know, Republicans and Democrats are working together in ways on China that they wouldn't on other things. And all of that is true. And we have done some important things. But if we really took it seriously, then we would be able to have a trade policy in Asia, which we currently cannot have because it's too domestically politically sensitive. And if we were really serious, we would have a strategic immigration policy where we would expand the number of people who could come to the United States and contribute to this being the most innovative country in the world and stay here. We can't do that because immigration is too politically sensitive. If we were really serious about it, we would divest legacy weapon systems and put all our resources into the stuff that we think would be best configured for a kind of fight that we don't want to get ourselves into in Asia in the first place. But that's hard too because of the politics and all of this other stuff. So we've made a lot of progress, but we haven't sort of taken the biggest steps to say we're taking these challenges seriously enough to get over our own domestic uh, political divisions and 
and and more narrowly construed interests. And that's um, what I at least I I hope that we can do. Yeah, I think, Jim, I know you have a question, but the political will piece is, I think, that one of the most worrying thing. And just to put it in the context of Russia, I mean, again, if you're thinking about the risk of a future confrontation with Russia, not now, but once it has the ability to regenerate military force, I think the scenario that is most likely for conflict is one in which we are not able to convince Putin that we have the political will and the cohesion as an alliance to respond. And that can come from different things, whether it's the re-election of President Trump or, you know, heaven forbid, we are engaged in a military confrontation in the Indo-Pacific. I worry quite a lot that he would then think we lack the political will and capacity um, and make a move in Europe. But so that's the, I think that's the thing I worry about most. But Jim, well, uh, you, you said just what I was going to say, so I'll just add a little bit on to it and, and, and then see what you all say. But I worry about this as well, just, just what Andrea was saying. And uh, Richard, one of the things I worry about is we talk about our allies and our allies' capabilities, even if they had the political will, and not all of them do, uh, and even if, they ha- if they're putting their money towards rearming so that they can take on more of the burden from the U.S. in terms of defense of Europe, even if they had the money. Um, the that industrial uh, base concern is really bad in Europe. Uh, I I I, uh, I I hear such amazing stories uh, from allies as they come through talking about there's only one plant that makes TNT uh, in all of Europe, uh, and this is important for artillery shells. And uh, and so it's something that I um, I, I worry about because. Uh, we're going to need those allies if we're if we're going to have two things happen at the same time uh, in Asia and in Europe. Uh, we're going to really need the allies, and they are not ready now. And if you, even if you look at your top three allies, uh, uh, France, uh, UK, and Germany, I mean, we 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 know where the problems are. And so, my question to you all is what what Andrea said, as well as adding on to it that that I don't think for the medium term we're going to have an a- allies that would not be really dependent on reinforcement across the board in terms of capabilities, reinforcements from the United States that that uh, may or may not come, or if they come, they may come really late because we're tied up in the Pacific. And I was just wondering, is that scenario something you all worry about too, or is that just a Brussels sprouts worry? <laughs> well, Jim, I mean, I, it's true that we will have allies that aren't capable of defending themselves without reinforcement by the United States, but that's always been the case. I mean, even when the European allies were spending a multiple percent of GDP on defense compared to what they're spending now. We had troops in Europe and the plan was for troops, American troops to fight in Europe because the Europeans were unable to defend themselves in the face of an attack by the Red Army. So, I mean, some of this, I think, is variations on a theme. Um, It has never been the case where we said the United States is, or post-World War II, we said the United States is only going to focus on China and Asia and you Europeans, this is this is up to you. Nor, I mean, we've tried to say that multiple times in the Middle East, and then when we do, it burns us, and we go back. So yeah. I think we can learn a few lessons here. That look, the United States is not a regional power; it's a global power. It has interests in multiple regions. It has allies, but these allies are not free to just act completely on their own. That's one of the reasons why they have alliances in the first place. And so the question is, how do you work together with your allies to spread your resources across what has become a global portfolio of risk with greater concentrations in some places than others? That is no easy task, but I think that that can be done. And I do think it takes a fresh look at force planning because we've really optimized our forces for two you know, long wars in the Middle East, greater Middle East, Afghanistan, Iraq, and the rotation base to sustain those across particularly land forces and air forces, um, lesser extent naval. But, um, and this is a very different situation. And we've got to take into account what we can count on from allies. Where are the kind of high demand, low density assets that would be most taxed? How would we spread our forces? Are there areas where we need to thicken the force? And other areas where where we don't. Um, so I, I do think it, it's kind of some fresh looking at scenarios in different combinations uh, relative to one another, both from a deterrence perspective and, if necessary, a warfighting perspective. I think it's absolutely essential because um, this the volatility that we're seeing could present us with a very different combinations of challenges than what we've been 
focused on for the last 20 years. Right. I have a slightly random question before maybe we get to some of your predictions for this year. And my, it's about, Michelle, you were talking about kind of technological advances and the need for us, you know, we have to pass a budget so we can start new programs. And so I certainly get the importance of the uh, competition on the in the technology sphere. But when you look at what's happening in Russia, Ukraine, most people are kind of likening that war to, you know, World War II, trench warfare, very kind of basic back to history, the way that that war is being fought. Or you think of the Hamas attack on Israel and, you know, Israel had the smart fence that was equipped with cutting edge technology, but Hamas was able to breach it in something like 29 different points in some places, just driving a bulldozer through and they planned their attacks over the radio. And so how, how from a kind of defense perspective, how do you think about both of, you know, needing to be prepared on both of those fronts, both like kind of exquisite technology and, but how important is that when you're going up against adversaries who, you know, just are using all these low tech kind of attacks on civilians and other things? I mean, I, I don't know. It's not a well formulated question, but there's a tension there. Yeah, well, you have to think across the range of options for your ad that your adversary has and think asymmetrically. I mean, you know, Israel spent a lot of money building a, a wall that would block them from coming through tunnels. And so they came over land, um, you know, the, 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 alongside the trench warfare in Ukraine, you see an unprecedented use, use of AI and drones um, and unprecedented use of commercial technology for uh, Ukrainian command and control. You know, so it, it is this mix of the very old and the very new and um, you know, it, it means that we, it takes a lot of, we can't, you know, uh, get rigid in our own concepts of operations. We, we have to, we, we will face a thinking adversary, whether they're a terrorist organization or a nation state, and we've got to be able to be agile across, uh, across the range. And so, um, but you're absolutely right. It will be a mix of the tried and true, uh, old ways and, opportunities that new technologies afford us. So I think in our last minutes here, um, if you got out your crystal balls and kind of were looking ahead at kind of risks um, that you see key trends in 2024, what are the things that you're both watching? What's at the top of your list? Um, what's what, what's going to drive the headlines um, and the, the national security environment that the U.S. faces this coming year? Richard, we'll start with you. Oh, okay. I, I sorry, I hadn't predicted on predictions. So, I uh, predicted predictions rather. So, um, well, I guess maybe a couple of ones that seem obvious, but uh, I rattled off before um, all the countries and entities that are attacking each other in the greater Middle East, and Iran is on one or the other side of virtually all of those. And um, both the United States and Iran, I think, quite clearly wish to avoid either a general war in the region or uh, a war directly against each other. Um, but when you add the possibility of this violence continuing to accelerate in multiple places across the Middle East, plus you've got this wild card of things we've sort of stopped talking about, which is uranium, uranium, Iran's uranium enrichment, uh, which was previously seen as a major problem. Um, and I think still is, uh, I don't know where that goes. Um, but the chances for, you know, a, a, something quite cataclysmic, I think are, are there. Um, and then of course, you know, the, the, the real wild card seems to be North Korea, just because it's so fundamentally mysterious just in the past couple of days or weeks where, you know, the North Koreans announced that they no longer see, seeking peaceful reunification with the South and, uh, you know, they have taken some military steps that they hadn't previously uh, taken before. And, you know, some experts are saying this is sounding categorically different than what we've heard out of these guys in a long time. And who knows? It's the North Koreans. This could all be bluster. Um, you know, there's a million reasons why the North Koreans uh, would not launch a war on South Korea. And I can rattle them off and tell a very good story why that would be almost unthinkable. But I could have also tell a story why Russia wouldn't have thought that they could come into Kiev and knock off the regime in Ukraine and occupy a gigantic country. And they did it anyway. 
Um, so, you know, who knows, but th those would be my, my probably two obvious nominees would be Iran and North Korea. Not obvious. I don't think. And I think the North, North Korea really has been like, I feel like the shoe that I've, you've been, everyone's been waiting to drop, or at least I have and kind of watching as you both have mentioned the deepening relationship with Russia in particular, and the way that that may or may not have emboldened Pyongyang to act out and having the political top cover from the Russians and other things. I mean, it's obviously in Putin's interest to see us all diverted and feeling overstretched. So yeah, that, that one I think was definitely on my list. Michelle. Yeah, I think the um, Israel-Gaza um, Hamas conflict will last longer than we expect. Um, um, and I think um, unless substantial additional humanitarian assistance is allowed in, you will actually see famine in parts of Gaza. And, um, you know, and Israel will be blamed for that, rightly or wrongly. And um, that will further complicate matters. Um, I do see there is a possibility, though not a probability, that this push for normalization with Saudi Arabia and Israel could bring things um, to a close faster and, you know, provide some pathway forward for the Palestinians uh, and, while securing Israel. Um, but I think that is, it's, it's highly desired by many people, but it's less probable in terms of just all the difficulties of, of realizing that. Um, I think the, the conflict or the situation that will be most affected by our politics is Russia Ukraine. I think Putin will wait to see who's president in 2024 before he kind of plans his next moves. Um, uh, obviously, I think, you know, uh, if President Biden were reelected and uh, managed to get more Democratic seats in the Congress, we might be able to reinvigorate the support for Ukraine. Um, if uh, Trump is elected, I think the likelihood is he'll abandon, he'll abandon the effort and push towards some kind of negotiated solution, which unfortunately will, you know, favor favor Putin or at least reward Putin far more than any any of us would like to see. Um, I think the the other thing I'll say is that. It, given the uncertainty about U.S. leadership and foreign policy, I think we're going to see a lot more anxiety and even hedging on the part of our allies. Um, every ally I talk to is extremely nervous about whether the United States, can we count on you? Will you be there? Will, will you be alongside us? And, you know, I think this will be a very fraught year um, in that sense as well. Well, there you have it. We've ended on our typical high note, Jim. <laughs> no, this is, yeah, it makes me feel we like- never the, disappoint. What's that? We never disappoint. We never disappoint. That's our motto. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you both. Um, this really has been um, wide ranging and really excellent discussion. And we're so thankful that you took the time to join us. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. And in, in our defense, you did ask us to predict some kind of hot spots and things like that. We, you know, we didn't predict all the places where it won't be raining and, you know, and the sun will be shining and things like that. So there's some of those too, including here at home. And, you know, I was going to suggest that let's end on a note of predict a good thing that's going to happen, not a risk or a hot spot, but what's the good thing that's going to happen in this year that we're all looking forward to? And then I realized I couldn't think of anything myself. So I thought I shouldn't ask that. <laughs> uh, it, this is a different way of answering that question. But, you know, we can point to all the problems that the United States has and we could rattle off a long list. Um, and Michelle, I think, very rightly said, when we talk about our great power challengers, uh, she'd rather have our hand than theirs. It's about how we put it together. But there's something else that's quite fundamental. I mean, you know, we have millions of people that are trying to come to the United States. Um, and some people interpret that as a crisis and you can understand why, but it's also a report card. It's a report card on the vibrancy of our economy, the dynamism of our population, the relative safety of our geography, uh, the overall stability and freedom of our political system, even if we wobble a whole lot as we try to actually achieve some outcomes. So we can point out all the problems, but we are pretty blessed to be having this conversation where we are and to be talking about how to 
keep the system, uh, the global system that put this in place in the first place going. I, I agree with that. And I would also add, in the face of all the challenges to democracy that we're facing, I fundamentally believe in the resilience of our institutions and the wisdom of the American people. We're going to make it. We're going to get through this. I think that's excellent. That's excellent. Well, here's hoping you're both right. <laughs> the intelligence analyst in me just can't get behind these rosy, these rosy predictions. So <laughs> or, here, here's hoping you're right. We'll have new photos from the Webb uh, Space Telescope showing us probably other worlds and maybe other beings out there in the next year. So that's uh, UFOs. I'm looking forward to finally getting, getting an answer to that. So maybe this year. All right. Well, on that wacky note, Jim. Um, <laughs> Thank you both. All right. Thank you. Thank you for listening to another episode of Brussels Sprouts brought to you by the Transatlantic Security Team at the Center for a New American Security. You can find all of our previous episodes wherever you get your podcasts. And please remember to rate and review Brussels Sprouts so that new listeners are able to find the show.